after all the fighting words from Washington, London, Paris, and yes, Ottawa, nothing's changed on the Syrian front. A bloody, brutal war remains just that, bloody and brutal, with no end in sight. But are we now at the long-awaited turning point? Janice Stein is the director of the Monk School for Global Affairs. Saeed Khan is a Middle East expert at Wayne State University in Detroit. Payam Akhavan is an international law professor at McGill. And Samantha Nutt is the founder of War Child Canada. Their thoughts in a moment, but first some brief background. Bashir al-Assad is still in power. The rebels are still trying to bring him down. And thousands are still dying in the crossfire. All that while hundreds of thousands have fled the country, creating huge refugee camps like this one in neighboring Jordan. Syria is a hellhole, where the West has spent more than two years saying it couldn't intervene and wouldn't intervene, unless, it warned, Assad crossed the line and went chemical. If you make the tragic mistake of using these weapons, there will be consequences and you will be held accountable. Which brings us to this Damascus suburb, where two weeks ago, the West is convinced chemical weapons were used, and they say they have the intelligence to prove it. There will be no end to the test of our resolve. But a lot of people are wary, remembering all too well Iraq and all that ironclad intelligence about WMD. We cannot wait for the final proof, the smoking gun could come in the form of a mushroom cloud. The echo of those Iraq words has affected the Syria decision. Britain was a hawk, but became a dove. I get that, and the government will act accordingly. Ottawa is having it both ways, 100% supportive of any country that attacks, but sorry, it won't be Canada. We have no plans of our own uh, to have a Canadian military mission. Which leaves it to whom it's often left, the United States. What message will we send if a dictator can gas hundreds of children to death in plain sight and pay no price? You strike if Congress dis so why the cold feet? What happens now? And has Assad survived again, living to launch more deadly attacks with no fear of retaliation? Good questions. Time for some answers. Well, as we saw in Neil's piece earlier, the Americans have yet to make a final decision, but there's no doubt all the tough talk has met a wall. Why? Basically, skepticism of U.S. intelligence, as you said earlier, Peter, and just unforgiving politics in Britain, particularly the shock of having that long-standing, staunch ally of the United States climb down. The shadow of Iraq still hanging over this site. And that's exactly right, Peter. I mean, we see that over the last two weeks, a lot has changed, not so much in Syria as it has in Western capitals particularly in the case of London, where Prime Minister Cameron really suffered a devastating rebuke with uh, the House of Parliament, uh, with the House of Commons saying no. Uh, Ed Miliband uh, trying to disavow the legacy of uh, Tony Blair, the former Prime Minister, leader, yeah. and he's the opposition leader. And so that really cost Cameron. We find in Paris, uh, President Francois Hollande initially said that a political solution was the only way to this. And then, seemingly, with uh, the UK backing out, France was seeming to then reposition uh, itself in uh, the better favor of Washington by saying, yes, now we support military action. And of course, uh, Obama in Washington is reacting to these things with his decision over the weekend to call in congressional authorization. All right. What does this mean in terms of where we are on this? And in the sense, who's winning this round? We know who's losing. We saw Nala's piece. What's happened to the refugees? But who's winning this round between the West and Bashir Assad. Hi. Well, further to uh, what has been said, we have to realize that the reason why democratic legitimacy, congressional approval is so important is because the chances of getting UN Security Council authorization are next to zero because of a Russian and Chinese mm -hmm. veto. Uh, but I would say that in this round, uh, maybe there are no clear winners, but one loser clearly is American credibility. And we have to realize that this isn't really about Syria. It is about a wider regional contest for power, which pits Iran against Saudi Arabia, against uh, Israel. And uh, that is the real issue in Syria. Sam? 
Well, I, I mean, I think it's important to emphasize again that really the, the big losers here are civilians. More than 2 million now refugees across uh, Syria's borders, 7 million people within Syria proper displaced, which is about a third of the population. I mean, it has been a humanitarian disaster and very, very heartbreaking. I think from a uh, diplo diplomatic point of view, from a geopolitical point of view, uh, Russia has continued to th uh, thumb its nose at every effort on the part of uh, Western governments to, to sanction Assad, to hold him accountable, to impose restrictions on, on, uh, on his activities, and Russia has responded with, with belligerence, um, and uh, obviously that belligerence is now paying off for them. Who's winning, Janice? I think Russia is a big winner here. I certainly think Hezbollah uh, that supports Syria very, very strongly and changed the battlefield equation comes out of this much stronger, and Iran as well. So that whole nexus in this broader regional war is a winner. The United States is a loser uh, in all of this. Obama's credibility is really in shreds, Peter, and they confront what I call lose-lose options. I think it's important to still recognize that Assad in the short term is a winner. Uh, after all, uh, there was not an immediate uh, run for attack. Uh, he has now bought some time to reposition assets. He also recognizes that as far as uh, uh, the UN Security Council, as Payam has noted, uh, there is no uh, consensus there and that Russia and China have pledged that they will block any kind of resolution that would authorize military uh, uh, reprisals in, uh, in the country. And at the same time, there's also knowledge that Assad has that this is a fluid issue in Western capitals. The very fact that he sees the news and he sees Cameron now a loser, he he sees Hollande equivocating and he sees Obama uh, having to persuade some people who are his political rivals in order to authorize a military strike must be uh, providing him with quite a bit of a grin uh, these days, at least on the short term. Well, for Obama, he has to decide now on, on what the consequences are if he goes ahead and strikes. And it, it sure, certainly sounds like he, he wants to and he thinks he's going to. Um, what are the consequences? Who wants to start us you off? Know, this could go really well and this could go really badly. What's what's really well? So really well is that the strike, which I think, by the way, will now be tougher than it would have been before Obama had to bargain with Republicans because in Congress. Because uh, Assad has been able to move things around if, right. if he still has that ability That's to. That's right. So this is going to be more uh, vigorous than it would have, than Obama originally intended. So really well, there's a 48 or 72 hours of strikes against runways, against aircraft, against missile installations, against Republican Guard. Assad says, OK, doesn't do anything else. Nobody else does anything else. And Assad figures out using chemical weapons is not a great idea. That's really well, really badly. Exactly what I described happens. Assad waits 10 days, uses chemical weapons again. Uh, against very resistant rebels in some of the Damascus suburbs or elsewhere, and everybody then is on the horns of a terrible war. Pam, what's, uh, what are the consequences? What could go wrong here? Well, I think the uh, issue of the chemical weapons is important, but it's a bit of a red herring because we have had 100,000 civilians slaughtered. We have 2 million refugees. Uh, and uh, for a dead civilian, it may not matter much if they die as a result of chemical weapons or artillery shells or napalm. Uh, so the issue is probably the fear how, of how weapons of mass destruction could be used in the region. But the problem that the West has in any military strike is that on the one hand it has to, uh, for the sake of its own credibility, punish the Assad regime. But if the Assad regime collapses, if the Syrian state collapses, that could be an even worse scenario with uh, al-Qaeda and all sorts of extremist elements uh, in a failed or semi-failed state getting their hands on these weapons. So I think that's also part of the reluctance in terms of uh, a military strike. And clearly, I don't think regime change is on the table. Uh, the best case scenario, uh, punitive strikes that force perhaps some sort of military coup in Syria, uh, the Assad regime is deposed. Do you and think that's possible? I mean, we've seen military coups elsewhere well, well, in the region recently, but they're in Syria. Whether it's possible or not, the only uh, realistic outcome in Syria is a negotiated power-sharing agreement between the different ethnic communities. You cannot have a situation like Libya here because you have a, a Sunni majority and a sizable uh, mm -hmm. Alawite and a Christian minority that could very well be slaughtered by the Sunni majority should 
uh, the tide of war change. And, and that's the reason why there is no neat military solution here. All right, Sam, consequences. Well, I don't see this uh, ending well on any level. I think that every outcome is a bad outcome. There's no such thing as a humanitarian bombing intervention. Um, that's a contradiction. And I see that while the, you may weaken some of his defenses in the short term, I agree with you absolutely that the, that if, that the danger here is that if Assad does fall, for, at least for the Americans, that their enemy's enemy in this case is also their enemy, which is al-Qaeda. And they have to be, it's a very, very fine line that they have to walk. And I think that uh, one of the biggest problems which we have seen is that, that everybody was very clear about uh, the use of chemical weapons as being that, that so-called red line. Uh, but the warning was, it was, was not very clear in terms of what the consequences would be. It, it was just, you know, don't do that or else. And then now we're stuck with, or else what? And it's just exposed how fractured the Western community actually is. You know, let, let me go out on a limb here. I think there's zero chance that the Assad regime falls as a result of a military strike. Zero chance. Yeah, frankly. I don't think so. I, but I think that's on purpose as well. Yeah, not, a, not in a one-strike scenario. Not in a one-strike scenario, which see is that. fundamentally what this is going to be. And that has actually officially been said. I mean, you see the disclaimers that uh, so many le uh, world leaders are saying that this is not going to be a target on Assad's assets and it's not going to be a target on Assad's regime itself. And so he feels then so a little bit the more point? emboldened. What's the point then? Well, it seems as though uh, Obama now is, uh, see, is trying to play out some time with rhetoric. And he's hoping that rhetoric is going to be adequate enough. And certainly the administration is going to spin it in that direction. They're going to say that for the last two weeks, but, uh, but there have been no other chemical weapon attacks. But that, uh, enough for whom? Like, like, it doesn't solve the refugee situation. No. It doesn't solve the fighting in Syria. It, it doesn't. What does it solve? It, 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 sol it solves nothing in Syria. And I think, uh, to be very cynical, one has to say it, it solves at least a lot in the White House itself. Uh, we find that if there really was uh, an impetus to try to uh, seek a humanitarian solution to this, if there was going to be something to be done about the refugees, it would be much more demonstrative, both on the Turkish border as well as in Jordan, which are suffering from huge influxes and have the potential of destabilizing both mm -hmm. of them. Them, at least in part. Okay, but I got to take a break, but you wanted to. I make think it one is quick... but chemical weapons. I disagree. Uh, chemical weapons are different. Uh, you know, it's been a hundred years since World War One, Peter, that we've struggled to outlaw chemical weapons. Uh, it is a big deal because it breaks a deeply embedded taboo. And I think for the White House, it is about chemical weapons. It's but not the, about Syria. But it's. It's not it's, about the Syrian it's people. A, it's not about the Syrian the people. It's not even about the Syrian regime. A hundred thousand people have been killed, mm -hmm. and but then a, when one thousand right. people are killed with chemical weapons, so in a sense, if there was genuine humanitarian interest, there would have been a very different it, shift in emphasis. It's and, not humanitarian. But it also implies okay. that that's the only way to deal with that question, right? All right, I've got to take that break, but we have more to talk about. We've got to take a quick break right now, but when we come back, the final question: What is next? Will anything end the bloodbath? And welcome back to The Turning Point. At the table tonight, Janice Stein, Saeed Khan, Payam Akhavan, and Samantha Nutt. All right, tell me something that we are not thinking about in terms of this story, the Syria story. Sam. I think one of the things that we don't fully appreciate here anyway is just how much support Assad still has within Syria itself. Uh, we need to remember that the opposition is extremely fractured, and the Assad family, it, it, at least within many groups within Syria itself, continues to maintain a, a significant amount of popularity. Fine. Either there's going to be a diplomatic solution uh, with Moscow and Washington um, figuring a way out of this quagmire, or we're going to have uh, a long drawn out conflict with potential for devastating escalation. And as I said, uh, this could be a stepping stone for a confrontation between the United States and Iran. Saeed, what are we not thinking about? We have to realize that this is, in fact, another Cold War regionally in the Persian Gulf between Iran and Saudi Arabia. And the conflicts in Bahrain, the conflicts in Syria, the conflicts in many of these other areas are flashpoints which reflect what is going on between Tehran and Riyadh. Janice. And Peter, JFK said during the Cuban Missile Crisis, there's always some son of a bitch who doesn't get the word. That's exactly what may have happened in Syria with the use of chemical weapons. It makes no sense otherwise. You're suggesting that Assad didn't know. Could be. Exactly right. What's going to happen here? Who wants to start? Ma'am, you gave us kind of a hint of your thinking on this, but what do you think it will happen in the end? 
Uh, I think, as I said, the only solution in Syria is a negotiated settlement. And the question is, do you use the credible threat of force in order to change the equation to achieve a negotiated solution? And Sun Tzu wrote in The Art of War thousands of years ago that the art of war is actually to achieve your objectives without going to war. But when someone calls your bluff and you don't carry through your threat, then that has very serious repercussions down the road. Saeed, what's going to happen? We have two weeks uh, before Congress and the United States comes back in to vote on whether to authorize this. This is actually one day more than the 13 days of the Cuban Missile Crisis. So it provides a bit of a pause, uh, a holding pattern, if you will, to decide. Unfortunately, though, given the rhetoric uh, today in Washington and uh, with Obama himself over the weekend, it seems as though the decision may already have been made, and he will go to war either as a cover with consensus or out of coercion. War implies a continuing conflict. This still sounds like a one-night strike. I've never found a conflict to be over in one night. <laughs> Good point. Janice? I think there will be a military strike. I do not think there is any chance of a negotiated solution at this point, either with Assad and the Syrian opposition, that's off the table, nor between the United States and Russia. Both of those would have to happen to avoid that strike, and I don't think there's any chance we're going to get there. I think the only uncertainty is that is the tragic one, which is that, yes, I do think that they will strike. I think that this war is going to drag on. I think that there will continue to be uh, tremendous civilian casualties. And I think that we are, as Janice uh, has acknowledged, a long way away from any kind of negotiated settlement. I think any arsenal that, that uh, the Americans are able to take out is going to hold Assad back maybe a tiny little bit, but I think Russia will step back in, Iran will step back in, Hezbollah will step back in, and, uh, and the war is going to continue, unfortunately. All right. A complicated story, a dangerous uh, story, uh, but one obviously uh, you've helped us try to understand a little better tonight. Thank you all. And thank you for watching. You may have thoughts on all this as well, and you can always reach us at cbcnews.ca slash the national.